I have a really short sermon today. You guys will all be happy. <laughs> Well, I finally showed up, and you're going to make it short. <laughs> well, that means it's six pages instead of nine. <laughs> okay. Heavenly <laughs> Father, make it short. I'm kind of excited about this sermon. I don't really know what to tell you. Because I got all these scriptures, and then I thought, okay, well, if the scriptures are really great and everything, what are you going to talk about? You know, because I don't even see how they go together. And then the Lord began to speak. And it was about you. And I prayed for specific, I prayed, God, only let the people come that need to hear what it has to say. Don't let anybody else come. It's not for them. Don't let them show up. And the Lord showed me that it's for Okinawa. It's for Uganda. It's for our people. That we call World Spring. And so, the message is tomorrow. I always look at tomorrow. We get caught up in tomorrow. We miss today because we're caught up in tomorrow. We're always planning for something new, something refreshing. We didn't even find out what we were doing today. You know, you wake up in the morning, you get your stuff ready for dinner. True? For those of you that work. <laughs> you wake up in the morning, you pull your meat out to thaw. Yeah. Right? Before you go to bed the, mar the night before, you look to see if there's anything for breakfast. It's really hard to serve a bowl of cereal if there's no milk. You're always thinking about tomorrow. So I want to know what New Year's resolutions you made this year. Did anybody make a New Year's resolution? <laughs> because it dies by tomorrow. True. True. Why do we even bother with New Year's resolutions? Isn't it so that we can find out what a failure we are? I made a New Year's resolution one year to diet. I, I'll never forget this. While I was eating. It's like, okay, so my New Year's resolution is I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do this and this. And, and while I'm thinking about it, while I'm talking to myself about it, while I'm encouraging myself, I go in the kitchen and make a meal. I'm sitting there going, well, this is not going to work for me. Right? Everyone wants to know what's coming. Nobody wants to be content where they are because they want to know what's coming. People are afraid of the unknown. That's what faith is. Faith is knowing that God is in your tomorrow. Faith is knowing that he has your back when you get there. Faith is being at peace before you take the next step. Faith is knowing the personality of God so that trust is paramount in your life. Faith is the confidence to hope with substance. Hebrews 11.1 now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we don't see. Another version says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Confidence, assurance, conviction. These words don't leave room for doubt. If you are convicted of a crime, is there any doubt you're going to jail? Or that you're going to get some kind of sentence? You don't get a conviction. You don't go to trial for something. Get a conviction and then have the judge say just kidding. Doesn't happen. It was just a joke. We just wanted you to show up. I wanted to hang out with you for a while. Doesn't happen. So these words are words that leave no room for wonder. I wonder if it's going to happen. I wonder if God's going to really do that. I wonder, I wonder if he really said that. I wonder, I wonder how you work yourself up into a frenzy. You work yourself up into doubt. You get yourself depressed. Mm -hmm. I wonder. There's no room for wonder and confidence, assurance, and conviction. There's no room for doubt. The fear of the unknown, this lack of trust, is, is a lot of what New Year's resolutions are all about. Part of it's hope for something better. You know, you're in a place and you just want to change. You want to change. You want something better. So you make a resolution that's going to happen. Like, 
wishful thinking or something, right? If there's no substance behind it, there's no truth. You're never going to keep your resolution. And isn't that really part of what a New Year's resolution is about? One quote I saw was, wow, it's New Year's. What resolutions aren't you going to keep this year? <laughs> you know? Have any of you ever kept a New Year's resolution for a year? Yes. My three, three months is about my max, right? Yeah. After three months, it's like, what is that resolution again? Do I really mean that? Uh, <laughs> so, look at the setup that New Year's resolutions are to make your words unimportant. It makes your life about intentions instead of about actions. It makes a joke of resolve. It takes away the value of your words. And doesn't the Lord tell you that the power of life and death is in your tongue? It makes for a negative reflection on the Lord because it basically turns us into life. God, I'm going to do this this year. Oh, five minutes has passed. I can't do it anymore. Too hard. Huh? Next year. <laughs> I'm going to write that one down in my book. <laughs> you know, it is. It's empty promises. It pollutes the fruit of steadfastness in your life, and it makes it like a poison apple for people to eat. So I wanted to know what is the history of New Year's resolutions. You know how I am? I have questions. So I'm going to give you a short history lesson. In 14, or 14, in 446 BC, the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar first established January 1st as New Year's Day. That's when it happened. It was a New Year's Day before that. Janus was the Roman god of doors and gates. Oh, counterfeit. Who's the god of doors and gates? Yeshua. He said he when he opens a door, no man can close it. When he closes a door, no man is going to open it. So you got to have a counterfeit. If you've got an attribute of God, there has to be a counterfeit. We need to recognize the counterfeits. So Janus is the god of doors and gates. He had two faces. If you've ever seen a coin with Janus on it, you've got a face looking this way and a face looking that way. We talked last night about eyes in the back of your head. That's what Janus is. God looking forward and looking back. Caesar felt that the month named after this god, January, would be appropriate door to the new year. And he celebrated on January 1st, New Year's. And how he celebrated, you ready? He ordered the violent routing of revolutionary Jewish forces in Galilee. Eyewitnesses say blood ran in the streets. He killed the Jews. That's what he did. Roman pagans observed the New Year by engaging in drunken orgies. Oh, New Year's Eve celebrations. By celebrating, engaging in drunk, drunken orgies, a ritual they believed constituted a personal reenacting of the chaotic world that existed before the cosmos of the gods. So New Year's Eve, this, the, the revelry that came on New Year's Eve, that is to show that before all the Roman gods showed up, life was total chaos. And they celebrated. New Year's Eve. In 1582, Pope Gregory the 13th, he has some really big, long Italian names. I couldn't get that. Um, abandoned the traditional Julian calendar, and it took the Gregorian calendar, which differs in two or three different ways. But it again affirmed that January 1st would be New Year's Day because they wanted to celebrate Janus, the god, the pagan god that looked forward and back and opened doors of opportunity and closed doors and closed gates behind you so that you couldn't go backwards. So on New Year's Day, 1577, Pope Gregory decreed that all Roman Jews under the pain of death must listen attentively to the compulsory Catholic conversion sermon given in the Roman synagogues after Friday night service. So the Jews had to come, they had to listen to this conversion thing, or die. 
On New Year's Day in 1578, Gregory signed into law a tax forcing Jews to pay for the support of the House of Conversion to convert Jews to Catholicism. On New Year's Day in 1581, he ordered his troops to take all sacred literature from the Jewish community. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews were murdered in that campaign. Throughout the medieval and post-medieval periods, January 1st, the day on which Jesus' circumcision supposedly was initiated in the reign of Christianity, was to bring about the death of Judaism. And it was reserved for all anti-Jewish activities took place throughout the Roman Empire, which, if you don't know, wasn't just Italy. I mean, it went up through France and Germany and England. It's big. Look on a map sometimes. It's huge. They wanted all synagogues, books, public torture, simple murder. All of it was to be done on January 1st so that they could rid the, the, the world of the Jews. The Israeli term for the New Year night celebrates Sylvester, which is the name of the saint. The Rome, one of the Roman popes uh, who reigned during the Council of Nicaea, which is in 325, which they did a lot of good stuff and they did a lot of really terrible stuff. They're the ones, the Council of Nicaea in 325 is the one that took Mary and did, started calling her the Virgin Queen and all of that. So they took all the attributes of Diana and called her Mary now. And it was the same God. So now... All they did was change her name. They kept the, you know, the Virgin Queen, the Queen of Heaven. They kept even the, even the halo thing around her head, even the blue robe with the white. All of that came from the goddess Diana, and it's in the it's in the Catholic Encyclopedia. It happened in Nicaea. Well, they did some good stuff too, but this one really wasn't. The year before this, uh, while they were convening, Sylvester convinced Constantine to prohibit Jews from living in Jerusalem any longer. They couldn't get them all killed, so they just made them all move out. Okay? And Sylvester arranged for a passage of viciously anti-Semitic legislation. All Catholic saints are awarded a day on which Christians celebrate or pray tribute to that saint's memory. That's December 31st. So the celebrations on December 31st are dedicated to Sylvester, who decided to eradicate Jerusalem of all Jews and destroy everything the Jews believed in. And New Year's Day, it celebrates the god Janus, looking forward, opening doors in the demonic realm. Okay? So isn't it, I just want to know, how did we get to January? How did we get to this New Year stuff? I just wanted to know. And my girlfriend posted it, so it was like so easy. I didn't have to hardly do anything. She had a whole bunch of it. She teaches in a Bible college. Who Sylvester was a god? She a saint. Oh, saint. Mm -hmm. So I just want to see how we arrive at traditions. And so knowing this history of New Year's Day, New Year's Eve, makes me like New Year's resolutions even less. I really don't like them because I always fail. So having said all of that, I feel like the Lord gave me some scriptures <laughs> concerning what our next steps are. What your next steps are. What your next steps are. These are not new words. These are old words with new revelation. These are a continuation and a confirmation of what God has already started in your lives. We're going to start with Ezekiel 36, 23. I will honor the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. The name you have profaned, uh, profaned among them. The nations will know that I am Yahweh, the declaration of the Lord God, which I demonstrate my holiness through you in their sight. The name of the Lord has become commonplace in the world. Profane. What was the um, Ezekiel what? 36.23. So we've talked about how the Lord has sounded the trumpet in America once again, and America is now turning back to the holiness that they were called to walk in when they were first 
became a nation, right? We've talked about this, that um, this is the year of that call. That trumpet sound started a few years ago, and it has moved. And now Christians, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but there are thousands of Christians that meet every single day for prayer in Washington, D.C. They have made it their life calling to move to Washington, D.C. just to pray for our nation because we have sat back too long. And it, look what's happened just this year. Abortion, the view on abortion has totally been turned. Amen. You know, um, the lady who runs Planned Parenthood, the blonde chick that runs Planned Parenthood, I can't remember her name, she was giving a speech the other day bragging about how many abortions they did last year. And instead of it being a look, you know, uh, the people that talked about it was, look what this woman is bragging about doing. The evil things that they've been doing have been exposed. And this last few years, it's been turning back. The attitude that Christians, you know, you can't even have Christian Bible study in your school, after school, but you can have a Satanist one. Those things are being turned around. Baha'i can meet. Satanism can meet. Wiccans can meet. But Christians cannot. Where the Christians have always met at the pole, the kids, the, you know, the beginning, first day of school, they, churches made that illegal. They're not churches. States made that illegal in some of the states. Kids couldn't get this before. There were some kids arrested a couple years ago. That's turned around again. It's turning around. Christians are standing up saying, no, I am a Christian. No, I will not sit back any longer. Right? So he's turning us back to the holiness of God. This is the call this year. If you hear nothing else, Hear the sound of the shofar in your ear. Hear the Lord calling you to holiness this year. We have to honor the holiness of his great name. We can't walk in half this and half that and sort of this and sort of that. And maybe we're Christian today, but we're not sure about tomorrow. And, you know, I was really doing good today, but tonight I want to be drunk. And tomorrow I'm going to do this, and tonight I'm going to do that. And we... I'm a Christian with my Christian friends. I'm not with my other friends. Nobody really knows who I really am, and neither do I. We have to stop that. And we do it to different degrees. Degrees. Every single person does it to one degree or another. Sometimes it's big. Sometimes it's little. Sometimes we think we have it hidden. God sees it all. And really, so do most other people. You know? Hiding is never what we think it is. It says he will honor the holiness of his great name and will demonstrate this through you, through the nations. You want to see Guam change? You're not going to do it through me. He's going to do it through you. You want to see Okinawa change? He's not going to do it through me. He's going to do it through you. You want to see Africa change? He's not going to do it through me. He's going to do it through Jerry and Donna and Moses and Everest. And, the, and Frank, and the ones who were there. He's going to do it through you. He's going to change nations because of you. Maybe you're not going to a nation. Maybe you're called to pray for a specific nation. You know, people make fun of me. I've been praying for Germany for 42 years. People make fun of me for this. How can you pray for a country for that many years? I am in love with those people. I pray for that nation. I did the same thing for Uganda. I used to sit and open the newspaper. Whatever whatever country was listed, that's the, I would focus on intercession for that. And I would not let that intercession die. It's up to you to change the nations. We get so consumed with our own lives, our own bills, our own what we're going to eat for lunch tomorrow, what we're going to have today. Are we going to be able to do this? How can I buy that? I need new clothes. I need this. I need that. We get so caught up in all that, we don't even realize there's a world outside of us. We forget that there's people dying. We forget that people are being ostracized from their families and acid being thrown on them because they said, I found Jesus. We're losing our children, we're losing our grandchildren, we're losing our families because we are infirm. It's time to be firm in what Amen. we do. 
It's time to walk with boldness and confidence because everybody in the world is suffering and they're looking for something to cling to. They're looking for something to hold on to. And if we aren't that, then we're part of the problem and we're dragging them down too. This is what's happening in Okinawa. They are helping save a nation. Irene and Kahiba are doing that and Keiko's on. It's what's happening at Travis Air Force Base with the Kindles. It's what's happening in Uganda with Donna and Jerry. It's what's happening here with all of you. Stand tall. Be firm. Be steadfast in what you do. Be holy. Repent often. And start again. Amen. You know, one of the things that happens is we think, oh, man, I messed up. I got mad. I'm bad. I'm a terrible man. All you really got to do is say, man, that was bad. Start up at God. I don't want to do that one. Okay, done. Now let's move on. Yeah. Right? He doesn't sit up there and say, well, I don't know, man. That was three points against you today. I remember I had I had trouble with, they call it in the Old Testament term, a besetting sin. Long time ago. It was a sin. I kept falling in the same muck over and over and over. I mean, I might sit, do the same sin 20 times in two hours. I could not seem to get my life together in this one area. I said, God, I'm here to repent again. Okay, I forgive you again. God, I'm here to repent again. I mean, I might not even move two seconds and I'm back, you know. And I was, it was a critical spirit. I mean, my mind would just immediately go to me. And so I just, no, I'm not going to walk in that. I'm not going to think those things. I'm not going to let that come out of my mouth. I'm not going to be that person. I'm not going to be critical like them. Ah, oh, repent again, you know, and just over and over. And when, then finally, one, at, at one point, I sat down on the couch and I said, oh, God, I can't keep repenting. I know you're not going to forgive me anymore. And he goes, who, who made you in charge of my forgiveness level? And I was done then. I was done being critical. But believe me, I tested the amounts. <laughs> Deep well. Deep well of forgiveness there, I'm just telling you. Repent often. Yeah. Start again. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 32. So you're just moving down to your verses. Mm -hmm. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You think you can't do it? You think you can't walk with the Lord? You think you can't keep his decrees? You think it's too hard? He says he'll do it for you. You just have to be willing. And then, and then, okay, we've got past the willingness, right? So now, and then, you always want to know what comes. I mean, if you're going to do this stuff, we need some kind of reward, right? <laughs> Y'all can lie about it. You can stand out there and say, oh, no, I'm doing it just because I love the Lord. You know darn well you're looking for a reward. And you know darn well you're what, sitting there thinking, I hope God notices me today. Oh. I mean, like, you know, we're like the puppy, like, we're like Bernie that every time Mike walks in the room, he's like, because he's going to get a treat. You know, he knows treat man has arrived. He does, I mean, I can come downstairs and he might not even act like he knows I'm here. He doesn't move. Mike comes down, he acts like he's six months old. You know, he hawks around and he just, I mean, you know, and then Mike goes out of the room, and he's like, out. You know, that's just how he is. And, it, and we're the same way. We think, oh, I hope God notices me today. I'll be giving me a treat. I, you know, I, I, did he notice that I did all this? What am I going to give me next? Isn't it how we are? And then we try to be all sophisticated about, I'm just doing it because I love the Lord. No, you're not. You might be doing it because you love him, but you want him to notice and you want a reward. If he says, if you do this, I'll reward you with that, you don't say, oh, if you keep that guy, you know, we want that reward anyway. No, we say, woo! Want to hear a testimony? I got a reward. I'll give me an example. Ah, the new purse. Ooh. Ooh. Losing my keys, so I have made up my mind that I'm going to put them in a specific. Uh oh, wrong. In a specific pocket. Okay? Because I keep losing them. Well, last week, and I lost them on Saturday. And on Tuesday, 
using Mike's key and praying that I don't lose it. And the spare key that I have attached to my wallet to get in the house, I am walking out headed to my car and I'm like, you know what, God? Your word says, to put you in remembrance of your word, and your word says that the angels are here to minister for me. I need somebody to find my keys. So I am asking you to go have an angel get my keys and bring them back. Now, I've dumped out my purse three or four times. Mike's even stuck his hands in pockets because we know they're here somewhere. I even went to the movies to see if I left them there. No keys. So I went to war. I know what the word of God says. I quit whining at God about losing my keys, and I start expecting the reward of God for the word of God. And when I got there, and I was standing in the... And I keep my pockets sick because pretty much because because I I'm practicing for pickpockets in Europe. And so <laughs> when I <laughs> we've already experienced them, so I thought I practiced now. So anyway, when I got to the post office, I thought, wait a minute, my pockets open, and there was my key like this. After I asked the Lord to have an angel bring them, well, I did not say. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I wanted to find them a different way. So we know that when he has promises, we want the promises. We want to walk in them. Uh, when you tithe, you get rewards. You get raises. You get debt free. You get rewards. Nobody says, come on. Nobody says, I'm going to tithe, but I don't really want you to give me anything. No, we're opening up the heavens, pouring out blessings we can't contain. We want it all. Look at the whole thing about short sermon. I'm on page two. <laughs> then, so now we know why we're getting to then, right? Because now we're going to walk in holiness. He's going to give us a heart. It's not a stone anymore, but a flesh. He's going to give us the ability to walk in holiness, his truth. So then. You will live in the land I gave your ancestors, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful, and it will not be bring famine on you. I will increase the fruit of the trees, the crops of the field, and you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and your wicked deeds, and you're going to loathe those. He's reminding us of the promises he gave us. He is offering to help us in walking away from sin. He's offering you a new heart, a new spirit. He is offering to show you how to hate sin so that he can increase in your life. Amen. He's offering to save you from addictions, from hateful attitudes, from sins that trip you over and over and over. And as you walk in that this year, he will increase your finances. The word I got. He promises here. You know, we read stuff like he's going to call for grain and make it plentiful, and we think, yeah, that's nice. No, that's money, people. That was money then. That's money. Are you going to say, oh, well, you know, I don't really need that? No, you're not. You're going to say, bring it. What was it I have to do? You have to allow him to put a new heart in you. You have to allow him to show you how to hate sin. Pretty easy. As you walk in all of this this year, he's going to increase your finances and he's going to fulfill the promises of your ancestors. He has promised your mother things about every one of you. He wants to fulfill those promises in your life. For me, I'm a missionary. It's from the heritage of my great great grandfather. I'm fulfilling the promises. He's fulfilling the promises in me from my ancestors and the prayers that they prayed for generations down. Who are you called to be? Do you know? Have you taken the time to look? Or are you just kind of getting through each day hoping you make it till tomorrow? Because remember, that's what this is about tomorrow. He says here, you will no longer suffer disgrace. There won't be, oh, and it goes on, it says, I want you to know that I'm not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord. So be, you can be ashamed of your, your conduct. You don't have to be. He's offering you to be have disgrace or shame removed from you. And it says, you will not be shamed anymore. That's really big here in this island. 
Shame is a stronghold. You know, we don't have to walk in shame. It's a stronghold, really, in Asian cultures, in every Asian culture. But especially here, it seems to be just so, you know, this is the season to beat shame. <coughs> you don't have to walk in shame anymore. You don't have to let it consume you. Did you ever make a mistake today? You bet you did. Repent often. Move on. Shame's not your portion. God has never shamed you. He's never been ashamed. And the whole thing of parents that go, shame on you. I've done it. You know, that's word curses. Take all that stuff off of you. Don't do it again. No, why do you have to say anything? Isaiah 19, verses 21 to 22. The Lord will make himself known to Egypt, and Egypt will know of the Lord on that day. They will offer sacrifices and offerings. They will make vows to the Lord, and they will fulfill them. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing, and they will return to the Lord, and he will hear their prayers and heal them. It has been year after year of making promises to the Lord, but not fulfilling them. The Lord hurt and wounded, prayer seemingly unanswered. This is the season of knowing God. He is offering you the ability this year to know him in a way you never know. <clears throat> this is a season of watching your enemies struck down. So what are your enemies? Addiction, poverty, indecision, fickleness, coldness, shame. Fear to believe that he will do it for you. You know he can do it for this person, but would he ever do it for me? That fear that says he would never do that for me. Isn't that one of your enemies? It's time to quit holding on, holding hands with your enemies and walking with them. It's time to stop that. Recognize them as enemies. And allow the Lord to strike them down. Heal the spots where they injured you. You know, a lot of times you can't get rid of the things that we are crying to him about because we're like, God, please don't let me be addicted to my phone. Please don't let me be addicted to my phone. Please don't let me be addicted to... Please don't let me be... A... We hold on to whatever thing it is that we want to be delivered from. We don't even really try to be delivered. We just make the words sound good. Sort of like a New Year's resolution. Let me just say it. Doing this, allowing the Lord to have your enemies and heal you, will allow you to return to the Lord in fullness that will set you free and heal you completely. Haggai 2, 6 through 9. For the Lord of, Lord of hosts says, Once more, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, so that the treasures of all the nations will come, and I will fill the house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver and gold belong to me, this is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first. I will provide peace in this place. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. This last year or two has been a shaking all over the world. The shaking has occurred so that the treasures of all the nations will fill the house of the Lord with glory. There's been fires, there's been earthquakes, there's been tsunamis, there's been more earthquakes, there's been volcanoes, there's been lizards, there's been typhoons, hurricanes, what else? And it's not just in one place. You know, we used to hear, 10 years ago, we'd hear about one over here, you know, and a few months later, we'd hear something over there. And now it's like, here, here, here. I mean, how many did have going on in California at one time? He owns it all. He wants to bring it back to his house of glory. You are that house. He wants his glory to shine through you. He wants to put his treasures back in his house. You're his house. You're the temple of God. I always think of Tanya talking about that she looks like this big cathedral, like Notre Dame or something with wheels on it, stained glass windows and light shining out. She's just wheeling through, you know, town. And we're where he brings the glory. We house his glory so that we can shine it on other people. It's not for us to look good. It's so those stained glass windows have his light shining through and people come to say, what is that? I want that. Bring it to me. I want this in my life. 
You're the place on earth that houses the spirit. You. It may have had miserable beginnings, but he'll make your end days more better than your former days. Mike and I are a great example of that. We were talking yesterday about first marriages. Not so good. Former life. Unrecognizable. Wouldn't recognize me, wouldn't recognize him. But look what God has done. Yeah. Oh, honey. Yep. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> are you going to move to the guy's house and place of glory? Or are you going to stay in the place where you are? Or worse, go back to it. You know, once you get a little bit of mold growing, it'll take over. Jeremiah 1, 5 through 10. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, don't say I'm too young. You must go every, to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and he touched my mouth and he said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot, tear down, destroy, and overthrow so that you can build and plant. I don't know if any of you have ever planted a garden or anything, but you can't plant until you tear up what's there. you got to rip out the garbage, pull out the weeds, get rid of the roots, mix up the dirt, get some air in it, get some fertilizer in it, hopefully get some stuff that works really good in there. And then you plant. It's the same thing in the spirit realm, and it's the same thing in your life. Every uh, Everyone here is called. I pray specifically for the called ones. You've been set apart, and you're appointed. You've been you've made excuses. All of us have. I'm too young. I can't do this. I can't do that. I don't speak well. I want to live first. I'm not ready yet. You know, I'm just a teenager. I need to do this. I want to have this. I'm not about my friends. What about my family? My friends are going to reject me. I can't do this right now because I'm really in love. And I have a courage on this person. Or, you know, but I have my family. You know, I've got kids to raise. I've got all these things to do. You know, my house needs to be clean. i got a job. I don't really have time to do all of this. I'm too afraid. All of those things I'm too afraid. What if I fail? What if I miss God? Not what I was really taught. This is what I thought church was going to look like. My family doesn't even understand me. You know, I don't really feel like it. I'm kind of tired. It just seems too hard. He knows you. He knows your excuses are invalid. He formed you. He knows you. And he knows what you're capable of. So what are you going to do? How are you going to change this year? Will you honor the Lord? Will you quit looking at your failures? Will you look at the Lord instead? Will you allow him to work in you? Will you trust him to rescue you when you get in a mess? Trust me, you are going to get in a mess. Probably some of you before you get home. You're going to curse at the driver that cuts you off, or you're going to you know, gossip about something. You're always going to get in a mess. He will rescue you from every mess if you let him. Does failure make you give up? No. Why? Well, let him rescue you. Then move on. So remember to repent, repent often. Let him rescue you. He will reach down. Are you afraid to talk? So many people hold back and say, I'm so shy. You don't want to speak to us. Shyness is just another form of this. Fear. fear. Yeah, it says he didn't give you a spirit of fear, but one power, love, and a sound mind. And in Amplified, it says he didn't give you a spirit of cringing, craving, timidity, which is shyness. He didn't give you that. You guys all know when I got saved, I, I, I stayed in the house for three months because I was too fearful to go out. You know, I'd go out to get food if I had to, and I'd have panic attacks and have to go back. Yeah, and then one day I decided that was really not possible. You afraid to talk? He'll reach down and anoint you. He'll give you the words to speak. 
People tell me, oh, I can't speak. Oh, I can't preach. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I can't do that. If you shut up long enough, he'll give you the words that come out. You can. Trust me. He has positions for you. He has places for you to come from. He has kingdoms for you to destroy. Kingdoms of shame. Kingdoms of poverty. Kingdoms of fear and witchcraft. Kingdoms of suicide and greed and gossip. Also that you can rebuild and plant salvation, power, and his majestic might as a foundation for revival. So what are you building? What are you planting? Where are you going to rule this year? Are you going to rule? Or are you going to be a slave? What appointments are you going to take from the Lord? What assignments are you accept? In Jeremiah 1.12 it says, The Lord said to me, You've seen correctly. I watch over my word to accomplish it. The Lord is saying that when you look, you do see correctly. You no longer have the kingdom excuse of, you know, that kingdom of doubt that says, I'm not God. He said, I do. You're correct. Trust what he shows you. Trust him to bring about what he tells you he's going to do. He watches over his word to make it happen in your life. Learn the word. Trust the word. Speak the word. I love that Mike used that scripture this morning because I was going to read it, but I won't now because he did. Because Jesus is it. This is your year. This is your opportunity. You're called. He's faithful. You know, I fast two or three months every year. The different prophecies and etc. that are on Facebook and um, Elijah lists and all that. I just don't read them. Because I want to be able to hear the clear word of the Lord as we move. As before I, well, after I preach my first sermon, then I'm going to look. So I wrote this all up. I got it all done last night. I finally started talking to you and I started writing down. Man, what do you have for people this year? This is pretty exciting. I'm so excited about what he's going to do in everybody's life. I am just like on fire for y'all. I couldn't go to sleep. It's like no reason to go to bed. I mean, I'm just like, you know, in the middle of the night when I should have been snoring. And so I'm doing all that. And I'm like, well, I'll just look through the list now and see if, I, see if I'm on point. <laughs> you know, everybody likes confirmation, right? And yes, does, do we hear from God? Did I not just preach myself a sermon about how I hear? And so do you. But instead I looked. Here's the first one I saw. Guy had three visions. And I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Pick up your assignments. This last vision I saw, this is a Mark Lombardo. Pierced my heart more than any other. In the spirit I saw an aerial view of a man's arm leaning on a large desk. I know the man was Jesus Christ. He was intent, urgently writing down eternal words on several pieces of paper. I couldn't distinguish what was being written. And every time he finished on one piece of paper, it would fall to the ground next to his desk over and over and over. He would write papers and casually fall to the ground to be trampled on. During the encounter, I heard the Holy Spirit say repeatedly, assignments, assignments, assignments. As I heard this word in my spirit, I automatically began to receive the vision's interpretation. And here's what the Lord said. There is an angel of awakening hovering over the earth. Angels are being released. Awakening is here. My beautiful bride that was once asleep is awaking up to heavenly realities and the in kingdom lifestyle. She's stepping into her destiny. In times past, I've given assignments to sons and daughters, but they refused to run with them. As a result, these assignments have fallen to the wayside. Destinies have gone unfulfilled because of a lack of obedience. In, my, in many of my people. Now is the time. It is not too late. You can pick up those assignments I've given you. It doesn't matter how long you've rejected my voice. You're forgiven. You're loved. Now is the time to rise up. Shine like a city on the hill that you are. Say yes to your calling. Follow me. It's time to run with your assignments that I've destined you. Because you're my If you're ready to take your assignments, if you're ready to hear your calling, if you're ready to do what God wants you to do, stand up and pray. Heavenly Father, I look at every person that stands. Lord, and I don't want to know who does and who doesn't. Just lift every single one of them up. 
I thank you that your word is true, though every man be a liar, that we can speak the word over our lives just like I did over those keys, and that you bring it about. Such a simple thing, car keys. Without them, I can't get in and out of the house. I can't go anywhere. I can't get my mail. Such a simple thing. And, Lord, your assignments that you have for each person here are bigger than a pair of car keys. So, Lord, I thank you that the ones that have stood up, that you see what they're standing for and that you will do it in their lives this year as long as they stay willing. There's really nothing else they have to do except be willing. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.